We are today going to continue. We're almost completed now. Uh, we, I think we have one or two more messages after this one here. We're actually going to be working on the last part of the armor, uh, which is a sort of the spirit today. Um, I'm trying to get myself organized down here exactly the way I want this. Okay. Um, we went through all the, the rest of the uh, armor, and we're going to deal with the sword of the spirit, which is the word of Yahweh. Uh, someone want to read Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 18? Or some couple of people want to split it up. It's up to you. Or you will be turning it around, or you will keep it like that. Oh, yeah, I could do that. I'm sorry. I don't know why I'm going to put it on there. People can read it. They can see it. They can read it off. Ephesians 6. 6, 10 through 18. Scripture, no matter where it's at, it, the Hebrew automatically changes to the right scripture. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so we, of course, we know that uh, we went through the whole armor. That's our Mr. Armor there. Okay. This is the part that we're going to be concentrating on. I don't know why I keep using the mouse. I can use this. This is the part we're going to be concentrating on today. This here is interesting because this is the only offensive piece of the armor. You would think that there would be more offensive parts to the armor of Yahweh, but there isn't. Now, how do uh, Roman soldiers use this sword? Let's look at Judges, chapter 7, verse 20. Judges, chapter 7, verse 20, I think it said. Seven verse twenty. If somebody has that. Okay, 
Okay, now let me give you a little background on the scriptures here. This, this is the scriptures where uh, Yahweh wanted Gideon to fight against a big army. And Gideon had 32,000 Israelites to begin with. He had them gathered near the Midianite camp ready to go. But they were still outnumbered because the armies that they were fighting against was 135,000. That's almost oh, better than four to one odds. Can you imagine fighting and coming into a battle and having four people on you at one time? Oh. It wouldn't happen very, work out very well for you. So even though he was outnumbered four, over four to one, Yahweh had other plans for him. Okay. Now, Yahweh told Gideon that whoever was afraid to go in the battle, he, they could go home. So, some people went home. Some people said, okay, hey, that's great, I'm out of here, I'm going home with my family. I'm going home, I, I don't want to be late for dinner, you know. But, so there was, there was 22,000 people that left, left the ranks and walked away and went home. That leaves only 10,000 people left. But Yahweh wanted even less than that. Imagine this. Can you imagine what's going through, through Gideon's head? Already he has 32,000 people. He said, okay, well, I, I have 32,000 people. This is good. But then a certain amount leaves. 22,000 people leave. Yahweh wants them to leave. So he's left with 10,000 people. Now, now you're looking at better than 135 to 1, I think it is, or something like that. Okay? But Yahweh was looking for even a smaller group than that. Yahweh had Gideon, had all the men go down to the uh, uh, lake, uh, a, a creek or a spring and whoever uh, lacked water like a dog would remain while the others were sent home. In other words, if men were, would lick the water like dogs, they would stay. Why? Because they're licking, they're able to look too. If you're doing this with your hands, you're looking down. So what happened was, there was only 3,000 people left out of 32,000 people. Oh, I'm sorry, no, that 300, not 3,000, 300 men out of 32,000 men were left. So what happened? They blew the trumpets and they went into battle. And the scripture says, the sword of Yahweh and Gideon. You know what else is interesting here, and I never, never ever noticed it about the scripture, is that the one part, I'm going to highlight it here, it says that and they held the lamps in their, in their left hand and their trumpets in the right hand to blow with all. Okay, so you had the lamp, lamp, lamp in your left hand, if I can say this correctly, lamp in your left hand and your trumpet in your right hand, where's your sword? Okay, so they're going into battle with a lamp in one hand and a, a trumpet in the other. What are they going to do? Beat the people over the head with their trumpets? See, Yahweh was going to do something mighty with them. Some Yahweh was going to do something miraculous with them. You see, what happened turns around and the men that they were about to fight started turning on each other. And they started fighting against each other. And this happened throughout the whole camp. It says in uh, Judges chapter 7, verse 22. I'll read that. 7, 22. It says, And there, the 300 blew the trumpets, and Yahweh said, Every man swore against his fellow, even throughout all the hosts. And the host led to Beth, Beth 
Sheeta, and Zareth, and to the border of Abel Mahol, Hola, under Tabit. So what happened? People that they were about to fight, 300 men, and no sword in their hand, start turning on each other. See, Yahweh knew that he was going to do something miraculous, and they weren't going to need to fight. So, Yahweh did something mighty for them. They didn't have to raise their sword to anyone because their enemies fought against themselves. What's this story illustrate? This story illustrates a, the, a valuable lesson here. It's Yahweh who gives us the victory. His sword will, will deliver us. His sword will deliver us. I've seen many, I've, or not seen, I've, well, I've seen them too, but I've, I've heard of many stories, many testimonies about someone who had to, was coming up, somebody was coming up against them, constantly coming up against them, and they just worship and praise Yahweh. And the people left him alone. You see, the battle is not ours, it's Yahweh's. We sometimes try to fight our own battles. We were always told that when we were kids. Well, you weren't because you didn't have any brothers or sisters, but I did. Fight your own battles. Well, this is one battle that we don't have to fight. Because Yahweh wants to fight it for us. So what do we have to do? Taking the sword. You just said that we don't have to raise a sword. Well, no. Throughout the world, there are certain individuals, real or fictional, whose identity remains almost inseparable from the weapon of, the weapon of choice. And what do I mean? There's a lot of uh, people in the world, fictional or not, they were known for what weapon that they used. From England, there was King Arthur and his sword. It was called Excalibur. From the Middle East, Eli and his, his shot chin turf. Wow, goodness, goodness. Zulfikor. Zulfiker? Zulfiker, I think that is. From Spain, you had El Cid and his long sword, it was called Tazona. From Scotland, you had William Wallace and his unnamed Claymore sword. Claymore is a type of sword, it, it was an unnamed sword. They didn't have a name for that at the time. So the sword is the only thing listed, only piece of armor listed by Paul that serves on the offensive capacity, which is what I said. Even if the, the, the rest of the equipment was equipped perfectly without our sword, it would amount to little, a little more than heavy armor, a heavily armored moving target. How can we go on an offensive if we don't have a sword? We go into battle with all this armor on and without our sword in our hand. What are we going to do? Maybe that's why King Arthur named his sword, not for example, his footwear. While, while the rest of his armor was uh, vital, it's the sword, and only the sword, that allows us to attack, to directly do the work that needs to be done. So, what purpose? Whoops, I jump ahead of myself. What purpose did this the sword serve in the Roman army? Okay, the Roman Romans, Gladius, the people who fought, had become known as the sword. It had become known as the sword that conquered the world. 
They had a Spanish design, and it, the prowess of a Gladys is close range combat. It's a, a, a tool that's used well in close combat. Okay, even if someone had armor, if someone from close range with one of these swords can penetrate that armor if it's done right. Now, they will not only would have a, a sword in their hand, they'd also have a dagger, which is about, I would say, probably about, about that long, about foot, two foot long, the blade itself. Okay, so they have more than just their sword. They also use spears. So what would you say would mean that all, what would all this mean for us? Well, they also use darts. But what does the word say? What what does the word? I mean, they use swords, they use darts, they use daggers. We use what? The word. The word is our sword. Psalms chapter 119, 105. Chapter, verse 105. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Okay, we see right here, right away, thy word, the word of Yahweh, is a, a lamp unto my feet. It guides our feet and a light to our path. It, it brightens the path. Isn't that interesting? That, that, that's a whole other teaching in itself. A light unto our path. When we come to Yahweh, it's the light of the word of Yahweh that guides us to Him. We don't just come to Yahweh without knowing, somehow hearing the word. We hear the word. It brightens our path so that we might be able to come to Him. You see, just like these lights in this room, how the lights illuminate or they brighten the room. In the dark, if this was a dark room, they would, it would make it, that would be our light. It's the same thing with the word of Yahweh, that the word illuminates. It shows us, it brightens our path. It shows us the path that we need to walk in Yahweh. You see, we have all kinds of books to study by. And my wife and I were watching a teaching last night about, about that. Um, but we need to always, always go back to the word of Yahweh as our lamp. It's easy to, to look up. I mean, to, to use other other things like a Hebrew dictionary and so on and so forth, and a Greek dictionary, and other, other items, this is good. But we always have to make sure we go back to what the Word says. Remember, if we're looking at something that's not in the Scripture, like a separate book, we always need to make sure that book lines up with the Word of Yahweh. Because that book was written by man. And just like any other man, any other thing that's written, it can become corrupted. So we need to make sure it lines up, whatever we're reading, with the word of Yahweh. John 17, verse 17. Sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. Okay. Sanctify them through thy word. 
do thy truth. Thy word, the word of Yahweh, is truth. Like I was just saying about other books, some people use other books. I've heard about preachers who have, have the a Bible up on the pulpit as they're teaching, and they have another book right next to it. But we have to make sure that book is teaching from or lining up with the word of Yahweh. Because this book might not be truth, but this one right here, the word of Yahweh, is always truth. Sanctify, Kadash, in the, in the Hebrew. As a matter of fact, that's interesting. I, I did that word Kadash, sanctify, is the word Kadash in the Hebrew. I mean, it's simple. Yahweh's word is truth. We have perfect confidence in the fact that his words are accurate. The scriptures say somewhere in the New Testament, I forget where, that they were uh, whole, they were written by holy men of Yahweh. Spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. They were written by the, the by man but through the word, through Yahweh, Yahweh's guidance. And of course, we know over the years, since the first uh, scriptures were written, which I think was the Gutenberg Bible, uh, I forget what year, but it was the Gutenberg Bible. It was the first one to be printed. So over time, since then, the scriptures have been corrupted. Not because of Yahweh, but because of man. Because man started translating the scriptures and putting their theology into it. That's why we don't see the word, the, the name Yahweh in our scriptures. Because the scriptures were changed. Over years, I mean, you, could, you can go into computers and you can see script. I can show you on my Bible program all the different Bible versions. But they were written by men. But this word was written by the hand of Yahweh through men. So we know that the, the King James Version Bible is the closest to the Hebrew and uh, the Hebrew scriptures. It was translated right from the Hebrew scriptures. We know that the King James Version is the best version to read from. You know, the 1611 Bible, Jesus, they don't, it's, it's not Jesus in there. It's, uh, mm -hmm. uh, I can't remember what it is. It's I ate you. I do. Yeah. I ate I I I I Yeah, I have that version on my, my Bible program here. Yeah. Jesus ain't in his place, he place in the Bible. No nope. man changed what they wanted to change it to. Yep, exactly, exactly. We see, even then, even before that, Yahweh's name was in the scriptures. The name of Yahweh was in the scriptures. And then in 1611, we look at it and it says, Iezus. Then it was translated over time. In this 17, I think these are, the, uh, the, this version here, I think is 1769. You know, yep. the letter J hasn't even been in the alphabet but for 400 years. Yeah, That's exactly. All. Yeah, yeah. So how in the world could it be Jesus? Yeah, it couldn't be. There isn't any way it could be. No. No. It's because man translated the scriptures to what they wanted to put it to. Originally, the holy men of Yahweh that wrote the scriptures used his original name. But, over time, man changed it to what they wanted. Hosea, chapter 4, verse 6. Hosea, Hosea. Hosea, chapter 4, verse 6.
people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge, because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee, that thou should be no priest to me, seeing that thou hast forgotten the law of thy Elohim, I will also forget thy children. Wow. My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Isn't that what it says? It says, my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Lack of knowledge of what? Knowledge of knowing his name. Not studying. It's that the scripture saying in the New Testament, in one of the Timothy's, to say, study this, show thyself approved on the Yahweh. A workman, workman that need not be ashamed. Rightly dividing the word of truth. Over and over again, it's, it's talked about how this word is truth. We have to study the scriptures, not just read them. You know, for years, I've been in the, my wife, Patty, and I have been in the truth for um, 30 years, 30, 31 years. You know, we always just read the scriptures. But since I came to Yahweh, I've studied the scriptures. Because you can get a lot more knowledge from studying the scriptures instead of just reading them. Yeah. A lot of people say, you'll hear people get up and testify in these big churches and say, yeah, I, I want to thank, you know, thank him because you know, I, I, I just finished reading through the whole Bible in a year. My question is, you read through it, but did you actually study it? scriptures. There's a difference. To read it's one thing. To study it is something else. In school, when we had to read something, when we had to read a book and do a, a report on it, we couldn't just read the book. You had to study the book. You had to, because you had to go a little more in depth than just reading, writing out lines that were in the, in the book. That's why Yahweh wants us to study his word. He wants us to not just read it, but understand it. Go into the Greek. Go into the Hebrew. You know, there's a whole world of knowledge in the scriptures when you look at it in the Hebrew or in the Greek. After reading it, Recently, I, re I, I was reading something, and, and I think it was word, the word kadash. Kadash. You know, kadash, we, re we read sanctify. We know sanctify, of course. We, and, and we read it, and we just say, okay, sanctify. Sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth, okay? But then we go in, if you go into the Hebrew, you get a whole new in-depth meaning of that word sanctify or kadash. You learn that it's a verb in the Hebrew. So, oops, I'm sorry. Luke chapter 11, verse 28. Luke 11, verse 28. But he said, Yea, rather blessed are they that hear the word of the old demon keep it. Okay, we see here, blessed are Blessed are they to hear the word of Yahweh and keep it. It doesn't do us any good to hear the word and not to keep it. It's for those who want to hear it and keep it also. Hear it and obey it. Um, 1 Peter chapter 3 verse 15.
to sanctify y'all with Elohim in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Okay, we see here, sanctify Yahweh in your heart and be ready always to give an answer to them that ask for the hope that lies within you. How can you give an answer of hope to someone if you don't read his word, the sword that we need? The sword that we need. We need to be able to give an answer to them. They look to us. They say there's something different about them. Let me ask them. We need to be able to give them an answer. So, why is sword? You might say, well, why is sword? Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and spirit and the joints and marrow and, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intent of the heart. Wow, that's interesting. The word of Yahweh is sharper than any two-edged sword. I don't know. I've never myself seen a two-edged sword. But it must be pretty, you know, a two-edged sword would be sharp. The scripture says it's sharp. The word is sharper than that because the word cuts us. The word of Yahweh cuts us. And it cuts both ways. Yep, it cuts both ways. It cuts cuts out the stuff that's in us that. We don't need that we don't need in us. It it helps us to live for Yahweh. It's a it says it's a, a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. That's what the word of, of Yahweh is. We think it's just, you know, words on on some pages. Well it's not. It's our guide, our our spiritual guide, our light, our lamp, as it says in Psalms 119.105. You see, just like a regular sword, when you go into battle, that we, you use it to go on the offensive, and fight and swing your sword and stab and everything. It's the same thing with the word of Yahweh. We need to be able to use the word of Yahweh, not on anyone. Not like, I mean, we need to come, don't get me wrong, if someone comes from the wrong doctrine, we need to be able to use the word of Yahweh to show them that the right doctrine. But what I'm saying is we, we don't need to use the sword, the word of Yahweh, to be to say, well, this is this is what I think the word says. Now we need to do it in a loving way. Use our sword or our word and say, okay, well let's sit down and read the scriptures and see what they say. Because it's the scriptures that are right. And that the word of Yahweh is what we need to follow. We need to use the word to fight the battles, fight our battles. We need to use the, the, the word against Yah, against Satan, just like the Messiah did. We'll get into that in a few minutes. Okay, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 4 and 5. While you're turning there, it, you know, we, the, the scriptures, just like a doctor uses 
uh, surgical equipment to do surgery on somebody, the word of Yahweh, the sword, our sword, does surgery on us because it it cuts at our hearts and takes out all the nastiness of our heart. Second Corinthians chapter ten verses four and five. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through Elohim to pulling down strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself, itself against the knowledge of Elohim and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Messiah. So we see what the word does here. You see, the weapons of our warfare are not cardinal. The, we think sometimes our battle is cardinal. And it's not. It's a spiritual battle. That's where we have to discern. Is this a spiritual battle or just a physical battle? Sometimes we can be misconstrued this and say, well, this is a, a physical battle when it's not. It's a spiritual battle. There might might be things behind the scenes that Satan's trying to do to come against us. But it's the word that we need to use. The mighty, mighty through Elohim, the pulling down strongholds, canceling down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of Yahweh. Even with our own selves, Satan might, we might get a thought in our mind, but we need to be able to discern, is this from Yahweh or is this in the flesh? Is this something Yahweh would want me to do or is this something I want to do in my flesh? We need to be able to discern, spiritually discern, with the word of Yahweh, the sword, whether it's us or it's Yahweh. All the other pieces of the armor are, are defensive. They're uniquely designed to be defensive. A solid defensive piece is invaluable. But the sword the sword we have is the only way we can complete the work that we've been given to do. You can't win a, a battle, an, an army cannot win a battle if they just do defensively, if they don't have a sword. They have to have a sword, they have to go on the offensive and that's what we need to do also, is go on the offensive against Satan. Because the Satan, in these latter days, he's trying to take more and more space. He's trying to claim more and more territory. Right in our own backyard. That Satan wants to claim our territories that Yahweh has given to us. And we need to take back those territories. And we can't do it playing defensively. A football team, any football team, can't never win a game if they play just defense, defensively. A baseball team would never win a game if they always were playing out in the field and never hitting the ball. They'd never win. It's the same thing with us. That we need to use the word of Yahweh, our sword, to go on the offensive against Satan. Now, let's look at something. Matthew chapter 4, verse 4. This is what I was talking about a few minutes ago. I said we better get back to it. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of Elohim. Okay, verse 7. He 
Yahweh said unto him, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt Yahweh thy Elohim. In verse 10, Then saith Yahweh unto him, Give thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship Yahweh thy Elohim, and him only shalt thou serve. You notice something about the scriptures, these three scriptures. I showed David my PowerPoint. He always, Satan was trying to come against Messiah. But Messiah always used the word to battle him. In three separate times here, and then it says right after that, the Satan left him. An angel administered unto him. It says, thus it is written. Where? Where would it be written? Because these scriptures, this is the New Testament, this is the one of the Gospels. This wasn't written yet. A lot of people out there preaching, teaching, and believe that Messiah walked around and the disciples walked around with the New Testament under their arms. They didn't. If he says it is written, he's speaking about something that was quoted in the Old Testament. If I had my Bible program, I could probably give you the cross-reference of where it, each of them is found in the Old Testament. But we see even, and even Messiah used the word against Satan. He used the sword. He didn't go back on the defensive. He went on the offensive. He said, thus it is written. It's written in the, in the scriptures. You have to obey it. So three different times he used the scriptures against them. Swords are, are sometimes used in close combat, not long-range warfare. Or they're always used in close combat combat, not long-range warfare. So unlike cannons, they can be used for long-range warfare. A sword is purposely used for close combat. Isn't this interesting that this could be the way that believers fight their battles in close combat? Acts chapter 14, verse 22. Confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith. And that we must, through much tribulation, enter into the kingdom of Elohim. Okay, we see here that through much tribulation, they have to enter into the kingdom of Elohim. How are they going to do that? How would they do that? They would do that through close combat. Because the, the, the disciples themselves knew what close combat was. Hand-to-hand -hand combat. They fought their battles. You can read it over and over again in the scriptures how they fought the battles and all of them except for one were crucified or were killed. I shouldn't say crucified. They were killed. The only one that was not was John. And he was uh, exiled to the uh, Isle of Patmos. And we see that in the book of Revelation. Acts, I mean, uh, not Acts. James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. My brethren, count it all joy when ye fall into divers temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith work is patience, but let patience have a perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, and entire one nothing. Saints, saints, weavers, saints, let me throw a bombshell to you. Let me throw a bombshell at you. We're no different than the, the, the disciples. We're no different than the disciples. The disciples went through trials and tribulations, and so do we. Our walk is not going to be a cake walk. We're going to have battles and trials and tribulations before we make heaven our home. That's why the scripture is here. It said to have kind of a joy, kind of all a joy when you fall into diverse trials. 
Know that, knowing that the testing of your faith, the faith of what? Your faith in the word of Yahweh and in Yahweh's promises. It produces patience. So we're no different. If we're going to go through all the same battles that the disciples went through. I mean, 30 years, 30, 31, 32 years, whatever it's been. And we've had our battles. We've had our battles over the years. I'm sure each and every one of us here could say that they've had their battles. That we've all had our trials and our tribulations. But the scripture says that we shouldn't count it, count, to count it as joy to go through these trials. Because it's going to work our patience. Our patience to hold out to the end for Yahweh. Now, the soldiers used javelins and darts from a distance to take care of their enemies. Saints, Yahweh's not giving us that. When we fight our battles, it's not at a distance. That's why we suffer actual trials. Now this might not seem like such a bad thing at first. But when we stop to consider that without trials there's no growth. Without growth we'll not be able to enter into Yahweh's kingdom. We see that trials, however uncomfortable, are an essential part in our journey as Believers. Let's look at Revelation chapter 2, verses 7. Chapter 2, verse 7. In Revelations, verse 11, verses 17, and verse 26. Go to Romans 2, 7 first. Revelation. Revelation 2, 7. Yes, Revelation chapter 2, verse 7. <laughs> you said Romans. You said Romans. You said Romans. <laughs> you said. <laughs> wow, that's weird. I didn't even notice I said that. Revelation chapter 2, verse 7. I had to go to Romans 2, verse 7. I wonder what I'm going to go with that. I don't even know what Romans 2 and 7 says. Wait, you went both. Yeah. You said Revelation or Romans. I said Romans. Because when you said Romans, I went to go to Ro Romans and I was like, no. Nah. <laughs> yeah, I wonder why y'all were stopping or you look, were looking at me like, where is he going? Revelation chapter 2, verse 7. It's up on the screen and we can read, read that in red. <laughs> He that have an ear and ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Okay, so we see here that we have to over. If we overcome, He's going to give us the, the tree of life. Verse uh, eleven. He that half an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be heard of the second death. So we see here that he that overcometh again. Verse 17. He that hath an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth it. Okay, again, he that overcometh, overcomes what? Our trials and our tribulations. Verse 26. And I gave her space. You said 26? Yes. Sorry. And he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end to him will I give power over the nations. Okay, so we see that over and over again in these scriptures it says, he that overcometh. 
Now let's jump up to the next chapter, chapter 3. We'll go to verse 5, starting in verse 5. He that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. Okay, verse 12. He that overcometh will I make a pillar and the temple my Elohim, and he shall go no more out, and I will write upon him the name of my Elohim and the name of the city of my Elohim. Which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my Elohim, and I will write upon him my new name. Okay, and verse 21. To him that overcometh, will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and set, and am set down with my Father in his throne. Okay, so we see here in all these scriptures that I just gave in Revelation. It says to who he that overcomes, not to the he that stands as he is, stays as he is. You see, we can't stay like we are. We have to be overcomers. And the scriptures say over and over again in these scriptures, he that overcometh, to he that overcometh. Overcometh what? Overcometh the trials and the tribulations. With patience. Now, out of all the, the, the armor that we used, we listed, we've done, there's only been that one offensive arm piece, and that's the word or the sword. You see, the thing is, there's no enemy in the world. There's no enemy that the word of Yahweh, coupled with his spirit, cannot defeat. So we're armed, so we have our sword. We can step out to fight our enemies head on. The struggle is real. We all have known how the struggle is real. It's immediate. It's in front of us. Our future in Yahweh's kingdom is on the line. We must take up the battle so that we can hold fast to the future. The future that He's promised us in His Word. So you would ask, what promises is that? What promises can we stand on? Let's go to Matthew chapter 24, verse 13. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. He that endureth till the end, not he that gives up halfway through the race. All these professional runners that run these races and these marathons, they don't ever win a prize if they give up halfway through and stop running. Stop running the race and they just go off on the side somewhere. He that endured it till the end. All we have to do, saints, is hang in there with Yahweh and endure it till the end. And we can see all them promises of in the book of Revelation, chapter 2 and verse 3, the Yahweh has promised us to heed it to, to heed them that endure it till the end. It says that we shall be saved. He that endure it to the end shall be saved. I think she wants you to move. <laughs> you can take your chair and put it on her the other side of her though. No, I want your chair. <laughs> Is that the position of the chair? It's the chair. Oh, okay. Oh, it might have been the chair because it would be air conditioning. <laughs> Romans chapter 8, verse 31. This time I'm going to say Romans. 
What shall we then say to these things? If all him before us who be against us. Saints, that a really good promise scripture. What can we, you know, all the trials and the tribulations that we go through on a daily basis, what should we say to these things? We need to remember, if Yahweh is for us, who can be against us? There's not a trial or a tribulation, a power from hell that can come against us, can overcome us, if Yahweh is for us. You see, we fight a, a, a battle, and we know the end, end result. We already know what the end result is. As long as we endure to the end, we win, and Satan loses. As long as we give it to him every time, we know we win. <laughs> yep, yeah, exactly, exactly. My problem is sometimes I don't give it to him quick enough. Mm. I put it in Darla mode, and um, <laughs> she don't win. <laughs> She, she don't have the offensive kind of. See, that's the thing is we, we have to give it over all our trials and our tribulations. We need to go back to the word of Yahweh and give it over to Yahweh. Then, I like that song, I lean on you, y'all. <laughs> oh, it's, uh, yeah. I lean on you. I old know the song about that. Yeah, it's by the Nillions. Right, group called the Nillions. I, st I have that on my spot right on my computer. Oh, I know the phone. Yeah. So as long as we do that, we're winners. Uh, like, remind me, I'll play that after, after the service. You see, we only have to read the back of the book. You see, when you read a book, you have a book that's like 10, 20, 30 chapters, and you want to know what you start reading that book. Of course, I never read a book, but so I can't speak from experience, that's for sure. But, <laughs> um, then, if you take a book and you want to know what happens, you go to the end of the book. You see, us here and Satan has already read the back of the book, he knows where he's going. And we know where we're going as long as we stay in Yahweh. Get in Yahweh and stay in Yahweh. As long as we stay on the offensive against Satan and not go on the defensive. See, that's the problem sometimes is way too often we, go on the, we, let, we automatically go on the defensive. We let Satan have his way. We get angry quick. We get we get angry too quick. We get we get to uh, come against somebody too quick. We try to fight the battle when we need to let Yahweh fight the battle. Isaiah, we're going to close with this scripture. Isaiah, chapter 46, verse 11. Calling a ravenous bird, bird from the east, the man that executed my counsel from the far country, yea, I have spoken it, it will also bring its pass. I have purposed it, I will also do it. Oh, okay. I was trying to figure out where he was going with that when he started talking about the birds and stuff. Mm -hmm. and I don't have the full scripture in front of me. I think I, did I give him the right scripture? 46 verse 11. It says, Indeed I have spoken it, and I will bring it to pass. I have purposed it, and I will do it. 
He promises. He's given us the promises in the Word. He's going to bring it to pass. He says, I promised it, and I'm going to do it. But the thing is, saints, that we need to go on the offensive. We need to use our sword. A sword is not any use any use to somebody that's not sharpened. We always need to make sure our sword is sharpened. How we do that? The word of Yahweh is sharp already. Well, we do that by studying, keeping ourselves sharp in the word of Yahweh. Every day, through Bible study, through just personal reading time and study time in the word, that's how we use our sword. Or we learn to use our sword, I should say. And that is all. That's all she wrote. Anyone else have anything to add? service, Yahweh, and for all that was said and, and, and sung and everything, Yahweh. We thank you, Yahweh, for your presence here today. We ask, Yahweh, to bless this food that we're going to eat, that be nourished and strength to our bodies, Yahweh, and bless the hand that made and prepare our food and serve our food in your precious name. Yahweh's Learning Channel thanks you for watching this video. We hope you were edified by this content. Reach out to us with the information provided on screen or you may click on the links to view more of our videos. Please subscribe to be notified of new uploads. Until next time, Shalom.